just a few days ago, the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter started to sample the thin Martian atmosphere, looking for the signs of life. Our desire to find it means that we've invested heavily in this search, in terms of time, money, but also emotion. And now, the Red Planet is even being talked about as a potential second home for the human race. But isn't it time we face the reality that Mars is a dead planet and destined to stay that way? Welcome to the sky at night. Mars, our nearest neighbour. There are many reasons why we're fascinated by it. But one question towers over all the others. Is there today, or has there ever been, life on the Red Planet? On tonight's programme, we explore the latest results and ask, is Mars a dead planet? And if so, what are the chances that the first life on its surface will be us? We'll be catching up with ESA's current mission to our nearest neighbour, the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. And also discovering how to build a rover that can survive and operate in the planet's brutal environment. Pete will be showing us how to get the most out of observing Mars in the night sky. Hello. And I'll be talking to Andy Weir, author of The Martian later made into a Ridley Scott film about the difference between his fictional human mission and reality. The exteriors were shot in Wadi Rum, Jordan. It looks like Mars. But we start with the very latest and most detailed pictures to come back from the Red Planet and find out what they're telling us about the possibility of life on Mars. In 2012, NASA's Curiosity rover landed on Mars like something straight out of Thunderbirds. And it's been working hard since then, sending us amazing panoramic images of the planet's surface. And these reveal that Mars was not only once a wet world, but that it was wet for far longer than we thought. I'm here at Imperial College's Data Science Institute to talk to Sanjeev Gupta, who's one of the Curiosity team. Sanjeev, hi, it's wonderful to be here in this amazing facility. Oh, <laughs> there's Curiosity. So, Curiosity's first goal is actually the goal of habitability. Were there conditions on ancient Mars that were suitable for life to have formed in, existed in, and been preserved in? were the right chemical ingredients, all of these sorts of things. So where on Mars are we and what are we looking at here? So we are sitting in Gale Crater. This is this crater that's about 150 kilometers in diameter that sits at the Martian equator. What we've got here is this incredible mountain. This is Mount Sharp. It's five kilometers high and it's made up of beautifully layered, stratified sedimentary rocks. You can see that on this image here. You can see those layers working their way up the mountain. That's right. These are sedimentary layers. And what these are recording is basically progressive buildup of sediment on the Martian surface. OK, so uh, something's depositing regular layers of sediment. OK, well, let's have a look. We can have the next image. There we go. It's, it's coming. coming up. <laughs> yeah, it's a big image. It's a big image. OK. The rock is actually a mudstone. It's a very, very fine-grained rock. And we interpret these layers to have actually formed in an ancient lake. So each layer is a season or something like that? Uh, we don't know whether it's a season, but it's a depositional episode in a long-lived lake. So long-lived is important, right? Because that tells us that not only was there water on Mars, there was water on, on Mars that persisted for quite some time. That's right. We've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years of sedimentation in a long-lived lake. What Curiosity has discovered is evidence of lakes that may have existed long enough for life to evolve. But its images also reveal that the conditions necessary for life 
may have survived even after the lakes disappeared. Okay, well, let's have a look at one of the more recent images. Oh, there we go. And here we are. This ridge is probably three or four meters high here in this face and just gorgeous detail in terms of the geology. This finely layered detail, which you can really see here, these layers, and then these cracks as well. We've been able to use the rover's instruments to actually look at the chemistry of the crack fills and actually they, they, they show evidence for calcium sulfate. So this is actually gypsum that's filling these cracks. And this tells us an interesting story about Mars. After these rocks were lithified, they were turned to stone, right. they were buried, and then there was groundwater flow through these rocks. And that groundwater was full of calcium ions and sulfate ions and it deposited within those crack fills. The interesting thing about this is that the chemistry, the chemical changes, are important to habitability, and that's really crucial. That's why there's so much interest in this. About whether there's life here. A big result from Curiosity is that we have these long-lived lakes that provided the conditions that were suitable for life, if it had ever arisen. Well, it's wonderful to see these images. It's lovely to spend some time on Mars, and I'm looking forward to seeing where Curiosity goes next. Good Thanks. luck. Thanks very much, Chris. It's been brilliant. Whilst Curiosity continues building a detailed history of water on Mars, it's not looking for direct evidence of life itself. For that, we'll have to wait for the results from a European mission. In 2016, the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter was launched from Baikonur in Kazakhstan on a seven-month journey to Mars. Since arriving, the TGO, as it's known to its friends, has been decelerating and entering a circular orbit through the thin Martian atmosphere. It finally reached that orbit a fortnight ago to start its mission, trying to confirm if plumes of methane exist above the planet's surface, because this is a potential sign of life. I'm here with Manish Patel, one of the lead scientists on the European Space Agency instrument on board, to tell me what TGO is hoping to discover. Manish, it's taken a long time to get there and now it's finally in orbit. How excited are you? Incredibly excited. I've put a lot of my own personal life into this mission and this instrument. So getting this here to where we are today has taken 10, 15 years of my life. So I am incredibly excited to get this first data from Mars. So you're talking about getting data. How are you going to get it and what are you looking for? ExoMars TGO is called the Trace Gas Orbiter. So it's looking for trace gases in the atmosphere of Mars. So by looking for these trace gases, we can start to unlock the secrets of what's going on on Mars, what's going on below the surface. The most exciting one is methane. So this is a very controversial gas on Mars. Basically, it shouldn't be there. It should be destroyed by sunlight. The fact that it's still there now says something is creating it. What levels of methane are we talking about? What concentrations? On Earth, we have methane in the order of parts per million in the atmosphere. On Mars, it's going to be at the level of parts per billion. So imagine a, a box full of a billion gas molecules and one of them might be methane. That's pretty hard going. I mean, and to actually be able to home in onto the one... Uh, and you can do that with spectroscopy by looking at the light. Exactly. By looking at the sun through the atmosphere, we can look at the spectrum. But it's these missing colours which tell us which gas molecules are absorbing that light and therefore that are present in the atmosphere. So if we do detect methane, what does it mean? There are different ways of making methane on Mars. One is uh, not involving life. So geological processes, for example, the action of uh, water and rock below the surface. So that's one kind of less interesting uh, process of creating methane, if you like. Sorry if I offend any geologists. But the other method that may be occurring on Mars that we have on Earth is the production of methane by life. What sort of life do you think we're talking about? A lot of the methane on Earth is created by organisms. This is an intriguing possibility. We're talking about microbial life, potentially, if it's existing on Mars. 
microorganisms below the surface. Because I guess with the surface, and it's radiated by too much UVs, nothing could survive there. It's a very harsh environment, but what's going on below the surface is a whole other story, and that's where the real domain for life is believed to be now. So you, there is the possibility for a nice, warm, benign environment below the surface where you can have liquid water. Oh, and then the methane is leaking out from underneath the surface. Possibly, yeah. Mm. What's more likely, in my personal opinion, is that life may have once existed on Mars. And what we're seeing now is the, uh, the exhalation, if you like, from below the surface of the signs of past life. Okay. Well, please do come back in and tell us the results as they come in, because it sounds like an exciting project. And I think people across the world want to know if there's life out there. So uh, we're all behind you. Thank you. <laughs>2021, the TGO is going to take on a new lease of life, acting as a relay station, sending data back to Earth from this, the ExoMars rover. Later on, we'll be talking about what it hopes to find and how it's going to cope with that hostile Martian environment. But first, Pete Lawrence shows us how to explore the planet from here on Earth. Mars is a fascinating planet, and when it's above the horizon, it's easy to see with the naked eye. Now, to get a better look, you need some magnification. So I've brought with me a 10-inch telescope, and I've got a high frame rate planetary camera fitted on the end. That's like a souped-up webcam, and that's connected to a computer, and that will give me a view of Mars on the computer screen. As Mars is low on the horizon tonight, the atmosphere affects the image quite a bit, making it jump and dance. This adds to the challenge of spotting features. Now, I did manage to get a capture of Mars earlier on when there was a gap in the weather, and you can definitely make out the gibbous shape of the planet, which we can see at the moment. But atmospherics are against me this evening, because I'd also hoped to see a dark V-shape. And that's one of the most prominent features on Mars you can see through a telescope. It's a feature known as the Certis Major. Certis Major is a region dominated by a volcano, and it's also where evidence of methane is thought to be found. One of the other features you might notice are the ice caps on the North and South Poles. And then there are other dark patches. Before we sent any probes to take a closer look, some thought the dark patches could be vegetation. And the subtle changes in the shape of these patches could be due to vegetation growing or not, perhaps with the seasons. We now know that the dark patches are exposed areas of rock, and the lighter regions are dust. And it's the dust moving about which changes the shape of the dark patches, sometimes obliterating them completely. Now, Mars is pretty tiny at the moment, but over the next few months, as we head towards opposition at the end of July, it will start to get bigger, and that's when you should be able to see some surface features on it. So, get out there and enjoy the view. In the quest to find life on Mars, there are many future missions planned. But for me, the most exciting happens here in the Mars Yard at the Airbus Space Factory, just off the A1 near Stevenage. The ExoMars rover. This machine will need to endure some exceptionally hostile conditions when it lands in 2021. To get an idea of how hostile, our online stargazing weather reporter, Elizabeth Rizzini, reports on conditions today in the rover's planned zone of exploration. 
So let's take a look at today's forecast then. It was a beautiful sunrise, just a bit of wispy high, thin cirrus cloud up there. That should develop into some very pleasant sunny spells, I think, as we head through the rest of the day. Of course, it's going to stay dry. And we're looking at temperatures up to a balmy minus 23 degrees Celsius, but a scorching 7 degrees on the ground. And then overnight tonight, I think we'll see some fog form. Temperatures down to a bone-snappingly cold minus 80 degrees Celsius. But that's not as cold, of course, as it is at the poles where we can sometimes Time to see it snow, carbon dioxide. Just a gentle breeze around today, but the winds will pick up if we see one of these dust devils form. In fact, around the outer edges, we could be looking at some gusts of up to 90 miles an hour. But at least that helps to lift the dust from the solar panels of the rover. Now, all in all, we've got some very pleasant late summer's weather around, so enjoy your Martian day. It's said, for every scientist working on a project, there are 10 engineers making it happen. And in this case, they really have their work cut out. Paul Meacham explains some of the unique challenges of making a rover that can search for life on the Martian surface. Now, Mars is a really hostile environment compared to Earth. So how is the rover designed to cope with that? Well, it starts with the extremes of temperature we see on Mars. In the day, it can be up to about 10 degrees in the Martian summer. That but sounds it, quite nice. <laughs> yes, it does, yes. Uh, but at night time, uh, because the atmosphere is so thin and doesn't retain heat very well, it can get down to as low as minus 130 degrees centigrade. Whoa. OK, that's a bit nippy. <laughs> yes, yeah. And most electronics that are sat on the rover are nothing special, particularly. They're the same sort of electronics we'd find in a mobile phone or a computer. Oh, so, so they're they, not designed for that environment? No, that's right. What we have to do instead is to create an environment in inside the rover that the electronics will like it. OK, so it's sort of a warm, dry... Yeah, so, yes. so, so it can operate sort of in normal conditions. That's right, yeah, typically about room temperature in, inside the rover. <laughs> this just looks like a giant sandpit, but how close is it to the Martian surface? It's actually surprisingly realistic, actually, in a, in a number of key ways. The first is the sort of sand we have in here. It's deliberately picked that it's the sort of correct range of grain sizes. It's also extremely dry in the way that Martian soil is. The sort of terrain you see in, in this Mars yard is fairly typical of the terrain we expect the rover to be able to handle. The locomotion system can handle a rock up to 25 centimetres tall, which That's is about 90% of the sort of rocks we expect to encounter. Uh, and it can handle any slope up to about 26 degrees okay. with this rather flexible locomotion system. And I suppose if it encounters anything um, higher than that, then it will sort of uh, go round or take another route? That's absolutely the goal behind the autonomous navigation system. So autonomous navigation, does that mean that the rover isn't being controlled from Earth? Yeah, the time delay between Earth and Mars can be as much as 20 minutes. It's really not practical or even safe under some circumstances to, to drive the rover remotely. Instead, you want the rover to make as much of the decisions as possible and decide for itself where is safe and where is not. What will be success for you? Well, it would just be to get the rover down on the surface, driving around, just to think something I worked on will one day be on the surface of Mars operating. That, that, that would be the success for me. And I guess success rates for getting things to the Martian surface has been a little hit and miss in the past. It has, yes. It's about 50%, I think, is the figure. <laughs> With such a thin atmosphere, it's not actually easy to, to predict what the atmosphere is going to be like during the descent. And that means that every time you go down, it's slightly different from how it was the time before. So there's some jeopardy there. For sure. And uh, we, we tend to refer to it as the seven minutes of terror because <laughs> you don't really know what's happening. You're sort of seeing everything with a time delay on it. Well, like you, I just can't wait until it's successfully on the surface and getting data. And please do invite us back because we'd love to see what it's finding. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> Once the ExoMars rover lands safely, it will slowly track across the planet's surface, hunting for elusive evidence of past life. Peter Grindrod, a researcher on the rover team, is here to explain the unique approach it's going to take. So we've got this marvellous rover. Where do you send it? Where are we going? So the first thing we have to do is use the constraints from the way that we have to land on Mars, you know, we have to land near the equator, we need to land at a low elevation to give the parachute time to do its work. So that rules out about 98% of the planet to start with in terms of the engineering. And so now at the 2% left, we have to try and find a really good scientific 
area or targets to find. We've narrowed it down to two. Quite close together in an area called Arabia Terra, and we're hoping to find nice, soft, sedimentary rock. We think that these sediments are probably going to concentrate the sort of evidence that ExoMars needs to look for. And so ExoMars, one way to think about it is it's a robot geologist. So what experiments will it do that will tell us about this landscape? Well, we're going to try and drive ExoMars as best we can to replicate what a field geologist would do. At first, you open your eyes, we've got the cameras, we'll look around and try and find good targets, and then we'll figure out the safest way to drive to those targets. We can use other instruments like ground-penetrating radar to look for layers, which are also evidence of sedimentary rocks. And then the ultimate end goal of this is to find a target that we can drill down with our deep drill core. And that's never been done before. We've never drilled under the surface to get a sample from Mars. In terms of life and organic material on Mars, the surface isn't a great place. It's bombarded with radiation. It can break down the organics. And we want to get down through that, that, that layer. We're hoping to go down to two meters. The models show that about two meters down should be protected by all the rock at the surface. And so the organic chemistry down there will be preserved as it was at the time of formation, we hope, and hasn't been broken down to, to hide the evidence of life. It was a pristine piece of ancient Mars. Exactly, pristine, yeah. It's, it's hard in my head not to think that you're going to dig down and, and pull up some green slime or something and go, look, life is, is there. It's, it's not going to be that simple, is it? I think that we're going to collect a nice looking sedimentary rock. And when you look at it normally, that might look quite boring, but I think once it's turned over to the, the instruments on board the rover, then that's when it become interesting. When those can look for the complex chemistry, the organics that are present, then I think it'll be exciting, but we're not going to be seeing anything um, as exciting as green sludge. If I have to push you, what do you think the chances are? Do you think we'll find complex organics, the kind of things that might suggest there was life there? Well, being honest, I don't know. I mean, that's why we're going there. Everything on the Earth has shown that Wherever we go, the, the extreme conditions aren't really a hindrance to life. We still find life everywhere on the Earth. And so although I'm unsure about what the results will be, I am hopeful that we will find evidence of life. However, the way that we explore and try to find the life with rovers, with robots, is inherently more difficult than using humans. It's easier if you can get a big sample in the lab. Of course, and ultimately this, this should be one of our, our aims. Because if we go back to the, the idea that extraordinary claims will require extraordinary evidence. Now, finding life on Mars is undoubtedly going to be one of these extraordinary claims. It may be that we have to bring back samples from Mars and put them into our labs on the Earth. So ExoMars is just the next step in a very long process of looking for life. Absolutely. Well, it's going to be an exciting mission, whatever you find. Pete, thank you very much. Thank you. We may hope to find living organisms on Mars, but it's likely that the best we can expect are traces of ancient microbial life that once lived billions of years ago when the planet was wet. But even if it is lifeless, that hasn't stopped people dreaming of going there and making it home. This Mars yard may be as close as I ever get to the real Martian surface. But there are many people out there thinking differently. What seemed like a crazy pipe dream just a few years ago is being taken very seriously by some. The future is vastly more exciting and interesting if we're a space faring civilization and a multi planet species than if we're not. We can complete the ship and be ready for a launch in about five years. Five years seems like a long time to me. Yeah. Um, Missions to Mars, planned colonizations, Chris met up with someone who knows a thing or two about this because they literally wrote the book. Andy Weir, author of The Martian. Hey. Hello. Uh, Andy, hello, it's Chris Lintot here. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? Yeah, excellent, thank you. The Martian described a future mission and suggested we could live there by growing potatoes in our own poo, a suggestion memorably recreated in the film of the same name. I now have 400 healthy potato plants. So you had the great privilege of seeing the world you'd imagined turn from a book into a film. What was it like seeing the places that you described represented on film? Do you think they did a good job? Oh, it was just an amazing job on the film. 
there's only so much you can do with narrative fiction and describing scenery. In fact, I tried not to do it. My editor made me put more of that into the book because I'm like, what? It's a bunch of freaking red hills. But in the film, such an intensely visual media. Oh, my God. Ridley did just an amazing job. The exteriors were shot in Wadi Rum, Jordan. It looks like Mars. It did make me think that part of the fascination of Mars is that those landscapes are very human. They could be Earth-like. Do you think that familiarity has something to do with the appeal? Well, I think, yeah, I, I think people are interested in Mars largely because it has a certain vitality to it. It has, it has an atmosphere, it has weather, it has seasons, it has uh, precipitation, everything you've come to expect from a planet. I know you've had, uh, let's call it feedback, from every scientist who's read The Martian. Uh, how do you think you did? So I like, to, I like to use real science and real physics in my books because it's already an internally consistent system. But yeah, I've had, I've had people email me, you know, say, oh, you made a mistake here, you made a mistake there. And that's great because, um, you know, if I, if I set myself up as, hey, I'm giving you an accurate science story, then I invite that sort of criticism. I've got to ask you about dust storms. I'm afraid, because obviously there's that dust storm that's critical at the beginning. What would it be like to be there? Go on, you could, you could put the record straight. What would it be like to be in a dust storm on, on Mars? Basically, uh, Mars does get winds up in the 150 kilometer per hour range, but the atmosphere of Mars is so thin that the, the momentum behind those winds would feel like you're kind of standing in a one kilometer per hour breeze. It could barely knock over a piece of paper, let alone a 27 ton spaceship. We're at 10.5 degrees, Excessive tilt. tilting to 11. That one was less of a mistake and more creative license. I knew at the time I was writing it that it was BS. For, for British I, viewers, that's rubbish, uh, yeah. I think is what you mean. Rubbish. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I went ahead with it anyway. It's a person versus nature story, and I wanted nature to get the first punch in. Yeah. So why, given that we want to believe that human ingenuity will win out, why haven't we gone? Why is all the discussion about the problems of going to Mars? Why, why hasn't it happened yet? Because it's incredibly expensive. <laughs> it's really hard to, to justify that expense. But, not, I don't know, wealthy nations throughout history sometimes just build awesome stuff because it's awesome and for no other reason. I mean, for the U.S., it's the Apollo program. For the ancient Egyptians, it was pyramids, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, maybe we'll build some pyramids on Mars at some point, just to say we were there. Andy, th <laughs> thank you very much for talking to us. It's really appreciated. Thanks for having me. Mars has always meant a lot to us been the home to countless stories and the target of many probes. The first human mission always seems to be 10 or 20 years away, delayed by arguments about money or discussions about the technologies that need to be developed to take us there and keep us safe on the surface. But despite these problems, I can't let go of the idea that it would be amazing to step out and explore this wonderful new world. That's all we've got time for this month. But do go onto the website and check out Pete's Star Guide. And also go onto Twitter to see Lizzie's Sky at Night weather forecast. Next month, we'll be discovering how the Gaia Space Telescope is transforming our understanding of our local galaxy, the Milky Way. In the meantime, it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. Good night. It's adapt or die as temperatures soar on Earth. We examine the end of the solar system with Horizon next on BBC Four.